The second part of this puzzle really is I started to look at all the research papers. So I am like, you know, I probably read thousand research papers. And the reason everyone who is starting an industry should do that is that tells you what is the most cutting, uh, cutting edge stuff that is starting to happen now. It's going to take 15, 20 years before it gets into the practice, but you want to see where the trends start. And it was pretty obvious four years ago, everyone was talking about something in the research this microbiome thing, and people were talking about how microbiome is responsible for depression and anxiety and you know obesity and diabetes and autoimmune diseases and all the cancers and blah, blah, blah. And Alzheimer's it starts in the gut and the Parkinson's it starts in the gut. I have no idea. I'm thinking, oh my God, there's something about this gut microbiome that seems to be happening here. And then you suddenly have this eureka moment. Oh, I think I found the problem. <laughs> Guess what? And that's where you have the oh shit moment. I think mm. like, oh, this can't be the problem. That, as you mentioned, the 10 companies were doing the microbiome analysis and the problem doesn't seem to be solved. That means either you are a moron <laughs> or <laughs> there is a problem lies somewhere else. And this is the, now, so coming back to my third thing, why me? Yeah. It is as an entrepreneur, it is not your job to have all the right answers. Your job is to ask the right questions. And this is the trick. What questions are you asking that is different from what everyone else is asking? And because the question you ask is the problem you solve, right? So in this case, I realized that every single microbiome company was doing exactly the same thing. They were asking the question about what organisms exist in people's gut. And they thought if they knew what organisms exist in people's gut, they'd be able to say what causes diabetes, what causes obesity. And in my mind, I don't know what these microorganisms are, but I thought, what if these microorganisms are like human beings? You could have thousands of different people with different names doing exactly the same thing that causes the disease. So you can look at two people with diabetes with completely different organisms producing exactly the compound that causes the diabetes. What if that was true? And I thought, what if the same organism produces completely different in your gut that is actually helpful? And in my ecosystem, being in this you know, a chaotic ecosystem, it produces something that is actually harmful. What if it's again like human beings? I am at work. I am an entrepreneur. I go home. I'm a dishwasher. What changed? Not me. The environment changed, right? And what if that's exactly what happens? So look at the things like acromensia or C. diff. C. diff can actually produce butyrate in some people, or it could be actually infectious and become pathological and become virulent and actually cause you to die, right? So point is here you have a same organisms doing completely different things. So I say, what if the problem doesn't lie in who is there? The problem really needs to be what are they doing? And what if we can understand what is going on and what they're producing, what is being expressed is the only thing that matters. And by the way, the same thing I thought has to happen in the human side as well. So not just the gut microbiome, on the host side, the human genes don't change. So you and I both know that if we do a DNA test today and then we gain 200 pounds, has our DNA changed? The answer is no. You become diabetic, has your DNA changed? No. And you can literally go through every disease. You become depressed, your DNA doesn't change. So if your DNA is not changing, how can a solution to, how can you identify the problem by looking at the DNA? Because it doesn't change when you get the disease. Or worse yet, when you have a disease that goes into remission or relapse, like autoimmune diseases like IBD, your DNA is not like one day when you're in remission, your DNA changes. And one day when you have relapse, your DNA changes. It doesn't, right? What's changing is the expression of the genes are constantly changing. And we, I thought, what if the gene expression is really the way to solve this problem, not the looking at the gene themselves. That, that simple thing is that it's the expression that matters, not the genes themselves. And believe it or not, it came from a really weird way of looking at this world because when you are naive and you don't have the idea of how to look at what these genes are, I thought the genes are like thoughts in your mind. They can be good thoughts and they can be bad thoughts, right? But 
You can have all the bad thoughts in the world, just don't express them and there's no crime. Right? You yeah. can think about every bad thing, just don't do it and you're totally fine. Right? My point was, what if the genes are like that? You can have good genes and the bad genes. As long as you can make sure the bad ones are not expressed, you're in good shape. Right? And so I thought, what if the expression is really the key? And interestingly, if you look at the human body, Casper, uh, you know, 99% of all the genes that are expressed are not our own. So our mm-hmm. human genes that we get from our mom and dad, it, they, they, they express give or take about 22,000 protein coding genes. And if you look at the microbes in our mouth and in our gut and, uh, uh, and other, other organs, they collectively produce somewhere between 2 million to 20 million genes. That means at best, we are approximately 1% human, right? Now, interestingly, you would think that if they control 99%, they would leave the 1% alone. It's like, fine, whatever. But no, 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 not them. (laughs) They, in fact, control that 1% epigenetically. So the things that they release in our gut, it gets absorbed in the blood Either it methylates our genes or it acetylates our gene and increases the gene expression or suppresses the gene expression. So even there, they control everything that's expressed in our body. So one could argue that 99.9% is actually modifiable. And that's the point. Forget about how. That means 0.1% is determined by how we are born. 99.9% is something you and I can control. So when someone tells you your genes are your destiny Mm -hmm. and you have no control over your disease, you and I both know unless people take responsibility for their own health, for their own action, it cannot ever happen that you cannot be sick. So sickness, that's why we, when we started the company Casper, we said what? Wild. Imagine living in a world where illness is optional. Mm -hmm. We didn't say imagine a world where there is no illness. Because if we said that, what that tells you is that we have a power to eliminate the illness. We didn't say that. We said you have the power to make sure you don't get sick. That means our job is to educate you and tell you what do you need to do. And you can say, you know what? Tough luck. I'm going to smoke. My answer is great. Enjoy your life. (laughs) My point is, the, the, so what I'm trying to say is, whether it is, now people talk about like aging, right? And we'll get to it in a second here. Aging is a chronic disease. By definition, you chronologically age, right? What if, just like any other disease, what if we understood what causes us to age? And if 99, 99.9% of our things are modifiable, can't, why can't we prevent aging? I mean, there is no, I'm not suggesting you don't, that you live forever, but you can increase your health span, not necessarily your lifespan. Mm-hmm. And to me, until you die, there is no reason for you to have to suffer from a chronic disease. You may not be able to increase your life, a lifespan, but health span is something you can absolutely do. And we know, you and I both know people or hear about people who can be 100 years old and healthy as a horse. I don't know why they say that, because a lot of horses are sick too. But 